Please open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 13, please. Our lesson will be from, mainly from this passage. What does God want from you? Have you ever thought that from the beginning of time, God has always required the very same thing from mankind, man, woman, mankind? Uh, it wasn't about uh, 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 building monuments. It wasn't about doing great things. It wasn't about organizing elaborate rituals. It was always about obedience, always. From the very beginning, obedience, the very first thing that God required from His creation, mankind. From the garden all the way past Jesus, always obedience. The times change, societies evolve, man grows in his knowledge and relationship with God, but nothing changes the fact that above all else, God requires simple obedience from man. That's the basics. Now in the Old Testament period, God promised the people you know, protection, blessings, land, even a place where they would live, a Messiah. He also required them to respond to Him in faith in order to gain and to keep these blessings. But that faith was always expressed in obedience to His moral and, uh, in this context, to His ritual laws. In the New Testament age in which we live, God has promised all of the things which the Savior has brought. Jesus has brought forgiveness and righteousness and hope of eternal life and insight into truth and the power to overcome sin in our lives. And in the same way, He requires the similar response of faith from us in order to acquire these things. And faith in our day and age is still expressed in exactly the same way, in obedience. However, not obedience to the law as it was given to Moses, but obedience to the words of Christ as they were given to the apostles and recorded for us in the New Testament. Uh, doesn't Matthew or Jesus, Matthew records, Jesus is saying his final you know, instructions to his apostles, not only to go out and preach the gospel, but also to teach them to observe all that I commanded you. Observe, obey, the command to obey. And so the times and the circumstances change, but what never changes for the people of God is what they are to obey and how they are to obey. And that's what I want to discuss this evening. What we are to obey as God's people and how we are to obey it. And I go to the Old Testament and I go to the book of Deuteronomy because Deuteronomy provides information to every generation about this issue of obedience. Now in Deuteronomy chapter 13, 1 to 18, the writer provides a clear example of what is to be the standard for God's people. These few verses explain clearly what God expects us to obey in every age, in every circumstance. We know that Deuteronomy is the book that records what Moses said to the people as he was preparing them to enter into the promised land, a kind of a summary statement of all the things you know, that he had taught them, the things that they had experienced. The greatest danger, he says, that they will face will not be the foreign armies or perhaps a hostile environment. These God has promised His people that He's going to take care of for them, you know, the people who are wandering in the desert. Don't be afraid of the armies. Don't be afraid that you won't be able to succeed when you go into this land, the promised land. The greatest danger, he says, that they faced is the loss of their faith by disobeying God's word. That's the greatest danger. Moses knew that if they lost their faith, they would also lose God's protection and blessing. And so he warns and instructs them how to guard their faith in the face of foreign gods and pagan practices. And so in this chapter, he's trying to tell them what God expects them to obey. And that is, in simple terms, His word and only His word. The point of this passage is that obedience to God's word 
is the ultimate test that someone or something is correct and pleasing in God's sight. And Moses gives three reasons why we should obey the word of God above all else. First of all, he says, the word of God is more accurate than signs or wonders. So let's begin reading chapter 13, beginning in verse one. He says, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true, concerning which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear Him, and you shall keep His commandments, listen to His voice, serve Him and cling to Him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to seduce you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from among you. you know, that's such a modern you know, uh, caution uh, that uh, Moses talks about here, relevant not only to these people then, but even to people nowadays. How many people nowadays, when they talk about their faith, they talk about things they saw or things they dreamt? Or a buddy of mine told another friend of mine about this miraculous thing that happened. And so, even to this day, people rely on signs and wonders and dreams to establish their faith. And so Moses said, even if a sign or wonder is performed or a prophecy comes true, if the substance of what is being said contradicts the word of God, the miracle and the prophet are to be rejected. You know, evil people can do amazing things. And through the power of Satan, many you know, uh, things can be done that can confuse people. Example of this in our world today where people's faith is based on miracles or visions or modern day prophet, and they might fill stadiums, they might preach to millions on television, they might build great religious organizations, but whose message and method contradict God's word. You know, people are easily blinded by flashy displays and signs but in the end, the word is the final judge of what is authentic and what is false. Not miracles, not dreams, not things that people imagine or see. Secondly, in this passage, Moses says that the word must prevail over peer pressure. Let's read verse six, continue reading verse six. He says, if your brother, your mother's son, or your son or daughter, or the wife you cherish, or your friend who is as your own soul, entice you, to secretly, uh, entice you secretly, saying, let us go and serve other gods whom neither you nor your fathers have known, of the gods of the peoples who are around you, near you or far from you, from one end of the earth to the other end. You shall not yield to him or listen to him, and your eyes shall not pity him, nor shall you spare or conceal him, but you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. So you shall stone him to death, because he has sought to seduce you from the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Then all Israel will hear and be afraid, and will never again do such a wicked thing among you. And so the Jews were to safeguard the purity of the land by striking down and destroying at the very source any movement that would lead them into disobedience. Men who, were being, men who were beginning a movement into idolatry, these were to be sought out and stopped immediately. Now in most, you know, we fast forward to today, I've noticed that in most church splits, 
You see churches closing because, well, sometimes it's the demographics. You know, people move out of a certain district, a church begins to dwindle, there are only elderly people left, and so on and so forth, can't get new families, and so churches close, and other churches are formed. But sometimes healthy, vibrant, you know, large congregations, so on and so forth, plenty of people, plenty of work that needs to be done, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden there's a division. All of a sudden there's infighting, all of a sudden there's quarreling, and you see the church divide, and because of that division, uh, the church uh, is destroyed, or that congregation is destroyed. And so in most church splits caused by doctrinal differences, or rebellious grumblers, or discipleship factions, the one common mistake made by the leaders of the church is usually the failure to act quickly and decisively and biblically in disciplining and or cutting off the infected parts. I remember in the Canadian churches when Lisa and I were working in Canada, the Boston movement, international church movement, you know, it came in and it, it filtered into the churches there in Canada like it did here. And, and one of the biggest problems was that we, had no, we, we didn't have a lot of elders in those uh, churches. A lot of them were mission point churches. You know, John, you served up in the Northeast. And so there were only a few churches that had elders who could stand up and say, this here, this is wrong. This here, this is unscriptural. You're trying to organize the church in a way that it is not organized in the Bible and, and we denounce you. Well, there was nobody to stand up and, and do that. And as a consequence, many, many churches were destroyed. They were simply taken over because no one of authority stood up and said, this is it. As a matter of fact, in, I, I, I was ministering and I was also in contact with a lot of churches in Oklahoma during that time. And one of the reasons why that movement did not harm many churches here in Oklahoma is that the church leaders here in Oklahoma stood up immediately and denounced this. They denounced it from the pulpits. They invited the leaders of this particular movement to come in and visit with them and they warned them. They warned them. We will not allow you to come onto our college campuses. We will warn the, uh, the, uh, the um, state colleges about your presence and the, 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 the division and the trouble that you've caused in other places. So we can't stop you from coming in and establishing your congregation or whatever. That's fine. But we won't stand for you interfering in the work of these churches here. And as a consequence, there were no church splits here. There, were no, you know, there wasn't the amount of destruction uh, in the brotherhood here in this area as there were in other places. Obedience to the word is what decides who is right and who should lead and who should be corrected. And the leaders in Oklahoma here, many of them, should be commended because they did the right thing, but more importantly, they did it at the right moment. They didn't wait till the damage was done to you know, try to save the furniture. They did it right away. They saw it coming and they stood up and were counted immediately. And so from the very beginning until now and until the day when Jesus comes, the word of God is what we are to obey regardless of signs, regardless of pressures, regardless of movements that we may face. In uh, the Gospel of John, in chapter uh, 12, I want to read a passage there, chapter 12, um, verse 46 to 48. Jesus says, I have come as a light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. I go back to my example of here in Oklahoma and the issues surrounding that movement that appeared here many years ago. One of the things that took place was there were many articles written in bulletins, in the Chronicle, in other uh, Brotherhood periodicals where uh, the leaders of the church in this area denounced this particular movement, but they did it from the word. 
They said this is wrong because chapter and verse and chapter and verse and chapter and verse, they equipped the church to be able to understand why this movement seemed unbiblical, was, 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 uh, you know, uh, was not following carefully the, uh, the structure of the church as it is uh, described uh, in the New Testament. And one of the, it, some of you may not remember this, but at the time these people were very successful and the argument was, but look at the success they're having. They're baptizing dozens of people a month. They've, they've built a church that has a thousand people you know, in, in, the, in, in eight months. And the argument was always, but how can you argue against their success? And to their credit, the leaders in this area stood up and said, here's the argument. Here's the argument against their success. It isn't biblical that evangelists are over elders. <laughs> That's not biblical. It's not biblical that one person be responsible to oversee several churches. They had a lot of ideas, good ideas, but a lot of improper or unbiblical ideas insofar as church leadership and church organization was concerned. And so that was a very important um, and um, strategic and effective way that the leaders here uh, uh, confronted these brethren. They, there was no shouting match. It was simply, let's look at the word and see what it says about what you are doing. And so the word became the final arbitrator as to who was right, who was wrong in this particular argument. And thankfully, the brethren here were not pressured into changing the structure of the church simply to gain some kind of artificial success. All right. If we go to Deuteronomy, this time in chapters four to eight, we not only get um, you know, what we are to do, you know, to obey, what does God want from us? He wants obedience to His word. We also get information on how to obey. You know, God provides His word to guide and protect and build us up, and He requires us to obey it. In His word, He also outlines for us how we are to obey His word. In other words, there's a quality of obedience that we should aspire to in order to please and show our love to God. This spirit of obedience is explained in various passages contained also in Deuteronomy, uh, chapters ranging in chapters uh, four all the way to chapter eight. So, Let's read a couple of these passages that speaks to the issue of how we should obey. So in chapter four, verse two, uh, Moses writes, you shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. So one of the ways, you know, the how we're to obey, we mustn't add or subtract from God's word. So it's only God's word. That's our guide. Restoration and New Testament uh, churches, uh, this is not a man-made, you know when we talk about the restoration movement, some people think that's a human thing, but it's not a human thing. The, the point of the restoration movement was to return to Bible ways of doing Bible things. And so one of the ways that we obey, you know, how are we supposed to obey? Let's simply stick to the word. Let's not add to it. Let's not subtract from it. Let's not change it. In another verse, chapter four, verse six, it says, so keep and do them, for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all of these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. And so obedience of God's word is what wisdom is. Contrary to what the world says. You know, when the world looks at us as Christians, usually the attitude is, no, no, you poor people. You believe the Bible? Oh, that's so sad. You know? You're so unenlightened. You know? Oh, you believe in that? Uh, you believe in the the creation, uh, oh, seven days, you believe in that? Oh, so really, after all of the you know, scientific proof, you know, <laughs> yeah, proof quotes, you know, they, they look at us as if we're you know, simpletons. But the Bible says that true wisdom 
is God's word. That's the true wisdom. True wisdom in God's sight involves reliance on revealed truth in God's word, not human logic. You know, we are growing in spiritual maturity and insight when we understand that principle, that wisdom and knowledge, the true wisdom and knowledge, comes from God's word, not from the world. Another spot, uh, chapter four, this time verse seven and uh, eight. Let's read that. It says, for what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as is the Lord our God whenever we call on Him? Or what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law which I am setting before you today? You know, we should be eager to obey the word because of its intrinsic value as divine inspiration. We say it so many times that it gets old for us. You know, we, get, we get used to it. But we are actually reading God's word. God's word, not man's word. God's word, what a privilege. You know, the, you know, way back in Deuteronomy, uh, uh, Moses is saying, can you imagine the other nations envy us because they're saying, Wow, what kind of God do you have? You know, we examine what He has said to you. No one else has a God that talks like this God. No, one, no other God reveals the truth as the truth has been revealed by your God, speaking of the Israelites or the Jews' God. It is our spiritual treasure and not to be seen as a yoke or something that keeps us from doing what we really want to do. In other words, our obedience should have an eagerness to it. I'm eager to obey God's word. I find the things of God important. That's the definition of piety. You know, a pious person is a person who sees the things of God, God's word, God's people, God's activities, a pious person is a person who puts value on those things, who considers those things important. It's something that we are losing in our society because in our society today, the way things are going, we have no respect for anything. Whether you agree with the president that we now have or not, have you noticed the level of respect for the presidency has gone down and down and down? He's just another guy. Well, he's, you know, he's not just another guy. He represents our nation. And yet we have any number of writers and entertainers and so on and so forth that make a living at, at, at denigrating and, and, and lowering the respect for that particular office. Again, whether you agree or not, it's not the issue. Well, the same thing is happening in religion. Hey, you know, God's my buddy, me and Jesus, you know, we're tight. Well, no, you're the created thing, he's the creator. There is always a measure of respect that needs to be there, always. Very important. Well, why is it do you think that parents and grandparents our church are teaching their children church manners. That's the only way I can say it. Why are we taking the little ones and saying, okay, no, sit, sh, 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 not now. They don't quite understand what's going on. What we're trying to teach them is what's going on in here is different than what's going on at their house in the kitchen or out in the yard. Something important is happening here and we're training them to understand that by helping them to sit quietly, to pay attention, to be reverent and respectful of the process, the thing that's happening, as well as the people. This is one of our elders, this is one of our deacons, this is one of our ministers, worthy of respect. That's what, we're, that's what we ought to be teaching our children and, and eager to teach them that. Because I'll tell you something, brothers and sisters, if we as parents and grandparents and great grandparents, if we don't teach them, I guarantee you our schools are not going to teach them. No disrespect to our teachers, they have plenty of work already to do without having to raise our children in, in addition to what they have to do. But if we don't teach them the quote church manners, 
If we don't teach them about reverence and respect, they're not going to learn it anywhere else or they're going to learn it the hard way. And we don't want that. What we really should want to do is obey the word because there is nothing like it in the entire world, nothing. Another passage in chapter six this time, verses four to nine, still in Deuteronomy. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be in your heart. Proper obedience requires that the word of the Lord be taught to others, especially family. And I think I was short there. I need to keep reading just a little bit more. It says, um, you shall teach them diligently to your sons and talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So now my comment makes a little more sense, right? Proper obedience requires that the word of the Lord be taught to others, especially family. We obey by teaching others to obey. And we haven't fully obeyed ourselves, again as parents and grandparents and so on, we haven't fully obeyed until we've taught our children not just the words in the Bible, but we've taught them to obey the words in the Bible and use every opportunity to do so. Why is it that at our house there are frame, picture frames of, of different things that we like, but pretty much every room has a frame that has a scripture on it. And that all meals begin with prayer. Whether it's hot dogs and chips, you know, that begins with a prayer. And the children are, are taught, we're praying now. We're going to say thank you to God now. So let's be quiet. And that's everybody be quiet. Even the babies, you know, they can do whatever, but they're part of this learning process. And then when they grow up, I remember when Lisa and I would go on vacation, the kids were still at home pretty much, or maybe just at college, and we'd all get together, go on vacation. One of the things that we would do every day during our vacation, if we were gone five, six, seven days or whatever, every day, the family devotional. Now we couldn't get that going during the regular routine because people were gone to school and they had jobs, but when we were on vacation, the family devotional was like a central part of the day. The kids would even say, okay, what, what you got for us this year, pops? Because I'd develop a theme or something and Lise would make a kind of a takeaway piece of, I don't know, a fridge magnet based on what we were teaching that week. We were teaching them that it is okay and profitable to be teaching them at every opportunity that we had because we are so blessed. Both Lisa and I are Christians and all of our children are Christians, so there's no reason not to teach them. Everybody's in on it. Chapter seven, verse six, just another couple here. And remember, we're, 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 we're looking at how to obey. Right? We, that we must obey, that's the first thing he wants, how to obey. Chapter seven, verse six, it says, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Obedience should be such that our conduct is superior to others. How do you get that from what I read? Well, what I just read tells us we're special people. We're the people of God. We ought not to be hypocrites, but if we obey the word, our thoughts and actions will be holier and righteous than others, and we shouldn't be embarrassed or proud. It's normal. Obedience is seen in holy living. Again, I go back to parents and grandparents. This is an expectation for our family. We're expecting you to act in a holy way. We expect that from you. And we're disappointed and you're disobeying us if that's not how you are acting when you're not with us. Verse 
And then in chapter 8, Deuteronomy, verse 1, he says, all the commandments that I am commanding you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your forefathers. So, God promises that quality obedience to His word will result in quality blessings. <laughs> His method and promises have not changed. If we know and carefully follow His word and only His word, we too will continue as His people. And one day in a world without sinful flesh or the presence of Satan, we will be so filled with the knowledge of His word that just as Christ existed in the form of the pure word and through the agency of the Holy Spirit became flesh, we who are now flesh will one day through the power of the same Holy Spirit be transformed into a perfect reflection of the word. He was the word that became flesh and the promise is that we are the flesh that will become the word. So let's leave here tonight convinced, convicted hopefully of three things. One, obeying God's word is the most important thing that we can do with our lives. It's the beginning of our spiritual life and it's the guarantee of our eternal life. Two, God's word is the final judge of what is right and what is true and what is pleasing to the Lord. If you have a dispute with a brother or sister or whatever, the word will help you resolve that dispute in knowing what is the right thing to do, what is the right way to act, and so on and so forth. And three, no matter how young or old, we need to make a greater effort to learn and obey the word as well as to teach it to others. You know, people have programs, door knocking, advertising, and that's all well and good. We need to do that. But that's not profitable if we neglect to teach our own children and our own grandchildren. What good is it if I go across town and I manage to find a, a, bro, a man or a woman and teach them the gospel and bring them into the waters of baptism and that's good for them but uh, where's the satisfaction in my life if I neglect to teach my own children and they go about not saved. Worse still they go and can never say my dad has preached the gospel to me or I know the gospel because my mom has explained it to me. We don't want to be parents or grandparents like that, do we? That our children will say, well, I don't know the gospel because my parents never taught it to me. They never explained it. They never insisted that I obey it. We have the authority to insist that our children do what is right and good. We should use it. So if we leave here with these three things, our time will have been well spent and you will have obeyed God's word. Now there may be some who also need specifically right here tonight to obey God's word. Perhaps you have not repented of your sins and been baptized. Well, please obey the call to do so tonight. Um, and if the Lord is requiring you, and you know it in your heart, if the Lord is requiring you to repent, to be restored, to make a better effort, to change something, and you need the prayers of the church or the witness of the church to help you do that, then please do respond to the invitation as Brother John leads us in our song of encouragement. Shall we stand and sing that at this time, please?